Now, let's go back to the infection again once, once, once again. You had mentioned that there's a higher rate. We probably should give patients some idea of, of how much of a higher rate there is between the primary knee, knee replacement and the revision in terms of the risk of infection. I mean, are we talking 10 times higher, 100 times higher, or just a little bit higher? Well, you know, we have to think of it in terms of a risk factor rather than thinking 100 times higher or one or two. First of all, let me give you a line that I use with all my patients. A complication happens in 100% of the patients who get it. So if you are the person who did not get infected, you didn't get infected. So if we say in a particular hospital area, the infection rate is one out of 100, we can argue that the revision rate could be as much as three to six out of 100. Now, so in some studies, we've looked at revision rates six times normal. But if your normal rate is one out of a thousand, six out of a thousand is still relatively low. What I find is infection rates after revision also have a lot to do whether or not the surgeon adequately worked you up, which means evaluated before your revision surgery as to why you failed. I have seen a number of people come to my practice because I do quite a number of revisions sent to me from other orthopedic surgeons. People who have been indicated, been told they need a revision knee operation, but nobody stuck a needle in your primary joint to see if it was infected. Whenever I take a person for a revision, I do an infection workup even if it doesn't look infected because one of the most common causes of infection of a revision is most probably a missed infection as the cause of the previous failure. You can't assume the loosening or some reason it failed even many years later is just wear and tear. Every one of my patients who goes for a revision operation gets an infection workup to see if infection was the cause. I will tell you that if you do that, your number of infected revisions goes down because you're finding infections before you go in and revise. I hope that makes sense in how we look at preparing a patient for a revision knee replacement. Well, I think a couple of questions there. One is, is, is what, what does that entail? I mean, what type of test do you do before you take that person into the operating room to, to try to see if they have an infection? That's one. And I think the other thing you need to explain to patients probably is, is how these infections occur maybe five, six, even 10 years after the person has had surgery. You know, there's, there's not anything going on in the knee at that point. We assume that if the knee uh, has been four or five years out from surgery that it's not, the infection is not coming from the time of surgery, this, the same way we would if we see an infected knee within the first few weeks or so. So I guess two questions here. One is, is how do you try to, what tests do you need to do? What types of evaluations do you do to try to rule out an infection? And then a little bit of background about how does a knee become infected 10 years after you put it in? In evaluating a knee replacement, a primary knee replacement that has failed for an infection, I group it into two categories of tests. One is indirect and one would be direct. An indirect test would be, first of all, some laboratory work. Some common blood work would look for a high white count or other indirect tests. Some of them may not mean a lot to patients when they hear it, but one is called an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and the other one is called a test called a C-reactive protein. These are simple laboratory tests that if they are elevated are an indirect sign of a possible infection. Two other indirect tests, which are at times fairly accurate, one is a bone scan, which looks at the general bone activity. Now, a bone scan will be positive in a setting of loosening without infection and with infection, so it's not the best test. But there are other nuclear medicine tests. One is called a white cell scan. A white cell scan is where the nuclear radiology physician removes your own blood from the body, 
and places a nuclear tracer on your own white cells, and these get re-injected back into you. The white cells go to areas of infection and light up on the scan. So a white cell scan is a much more sensitive indirect test. The most direct test, especially in the knee, is simply for me in the office to stick a needle in the joint. I pull out fluid and send it to the lab to see if it grows out bacteria or bacteria show up to the pathologist so he can tell me whether or not there's an infection. So in a knee, I will often do a C-reactive protein or another lab test with a white cell scan with a what's called knee aspiration. I do all three, they give me a total picture. So that's the first way to evaluate it beforehand. In answer to your second question, which is related to the idea of how does a knee many years later get infected? I find the most common is a change in the patient's immune status years later. I have seen a number of patients come to me who had a knee replacement, let's say for example 12 years earlier, 13 years earlier, they've since developed some type of cancer. They go through chemotherapy, their white cells go down, they are not able to really combat even any type of infection that's going throughout their body and I have seen a number of patients in this setting. So when people's immune status goes down, that's an issue. We're really not 100% sure why it happens. We believe it's through some type of infection from another part of your body that what we call seeds the joint. Although that's not fully clear because many people get all kinds of infections years after their joint replacement and don't infect the joint. But some people may be more susceptible to others based on their ability to fight the infection. So years later, it's usually from an infection from another part of the body that caused bacteria to go through the blood and for reasons that I believe are really not clear now, some people what we call seed their joint, but most people don't. That's why we don't see infections common much later. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, more preparations for undergoing a revision total knee replacement. Is there anything that you do other than this uh, infection workup, trying to make sure the patient doesn't have an infection in the knee, is there anything else that you would do differently when you're getting a patient prepared for a revision total knee replacement that perhaps you don't do when you just do a regular primary total knee replacement? As we spoke on a previous interview one time, we're fairly comprehensive in having our own in-house internist evaluate all our primary knee replacements and total knee replacements. So from a patient preparation, it is the exact same seriousness in the evaluation of your underlying diseases, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, all these things have to be optimized. One of the differences I do with the revision, I do expect more blood loss afterwards, and I would talk to the patient about the possible need for transfusions of blood after a revision, which is very uncommon in my practice during a primary knee replacement. But a revision often needs some type of blood transfusion afterwards. So I would prepare the patient for that possibly take some of their own blood before surgery for reinfusion later. And I think that's probably the only difference between preparing a primary patient versus a revision from the patient's point of view. There is a remarkable difference in how the surgeon, though, prepares for both of these operations.